I engaged in these activities as President of the United States, not with an eye of expanding the power of the federal government, though I was expanding the United States. But the idea was I was connecting all of the local communities that, connected, that, that were located along the way from coast to coast. My theory of our national government is what I called the empire of liberty. And it works this way. The further away from local government you get, the less power those governments have. So the federal government only has control over things that involve the entire nation, warfare, international trade, that kind of thing. And with each step, as you get closer to the local government, to someone's front door, there's more power to make more decisions. Until ultimately, each individual citizen is master of their own home, of themselves in the privacy of their own home. We didn't have a crucial step for it, though, what I called wards, what you call townships, in Virginia at the time. And this was something that was, a, something that was missing, and it was a key to my plan. And here's why it was so key. Because while I was president, I didn't have to veto any laws. And it wasn't because I, I had enough votes and I could force things through. It's because I invited politicians from both parties to come and dine at the presidential mansion. And the rule was we couldn't talk about politics till after the meal was over. So we got to know each other. I learned not to mix the parties at those dinners. I had to have one party or another at the time after I learned the hard way. But because of those conversations, by the time those laws got to my desk, those bills got to my desk to sign, the negotiations had already happened and we understood each other. I didn't have to veto a single law. It was because of those conversations. Alexander Hamilton, though I have criticized him and we disagreed, we came together for the placement of the capital. Either I'm sorry or you're welcome. It wasn't nearby where we are right now in Pennsylvania. It's a bit further south. And we did so over one of those dinners. It was in New York City, which was the capital at the time, where we were able to have conversation. I did this after my time in France throughout my political career. And what I realized was those conversations, if we rely on them happening in a distant federal government, two things are going to happen. One, there won't be many of them. And two, if we have the federal government being that which holds all the power, the further from that government our individual state governments get in this empire liberty, the less control the individual people have over that government. And then the less connection they feel they have with that, and the less American they feel, and it all tears apart. But if we centralize the majority of power in those local governments, in those townships, then those conversations can happen over dinners all over this country. And then those people vote for the next level up, and those have conversations, and the next level up, until finally, by the time people are being voted for, for the highest levels of government, they are of a character and of a virtue and of a reasonable nature that is the result of countless conversations in local homes all across the country. So my emphasis saying that these townships, these wards, are the most perfect invention ever devised by the mind of man for the preservation of our liberty and of every self-government were not based upon people wielding power in their local government and forcing other people to do what they want them to do, just like you're accustomed to big government doing. What they're contingent on is that technique that I used in my political career. That you, more than any of those people in Mr. Harris's ferry or in the federal city, you are capable of doing something that wields more power than they can imagine. Inviting your citizens to come and knock on your front door, or better yet, you go knock on their front door and having those conversations. So by the time the message reaches the highest levels of government, you have inevitably Conversation by conversation, front door to front door, molded and controlled what that message is and how that power is wielded. Thus, my friends, as I run out of time here, and this time, oh, well, I'm used to running out of time, as you know. It's been a few hundred years. I will conclude with that device that I showed you earlier that may seem antiquated to you. I know many of you have devices that you keep with you, that keep time uh, down to the fraction of a second in your pockets that coordinate with each other. In our day, this was the most advanced form of technology. On July 4, 1776, when we were able to sign that Declaration of Independence, John Adams said, we had made 13 clocks strike as one. And that meant something that was almost technologically impossible. I understand you have those devices that give you almost instantaneous access to all the collected wisdom and knowledge of mankind, but that most of you use them predominantly for arguing with strangers and looking at pictures of cats well, 
Do not be distracted by the antiquated nature, nature of this. You are more advanced than we are. You've taken your chronological precision beyond my dreams. But I ask you this. With all of your advances in your technology and speeding up of your roads, expansion of your roadways, have you improved in your ability to get all of your clocks to strike as one as we did in 1776? I will tell you this. It doesn't matter what technology you have. It doesn't matter how fast your carriages are or how many horses you're able to hide inside those carriages. I can't see any outside in your stables. The same thing that will get you to be able to coordinate those clocks now and then set the time in the federal city and in Mr. Harris's ferry is the very same thing that, was, that enabled us to do that in 1776. We had those conversations in 1776 in the city tavern in Philadelphia. In New York City, I had them at 57 Maiden Lane where I was living with Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Madison. In the federal city, I had them in the presidential man mansion. But it doesn't matter where those conversations happen, except for two details. One, that they happen, and two, that every citizen who has the ability to do so hosts them. And you come to those agreements, and you work together to set your timepieces and move that up then to the highest levels of government. My friends, it has been an honor to speak to you. And I assure you that if you do hear my name, I wish to talk to somebody about honoring my legacy. Know this, I do not need statues. I do not need monuments. Those are what tyrants and Caesars and Napoleons and Pashas and Tsars have and kings. The greatest monument I could hope for for the best part of my legacy is all of you. The citizens of this United States who give up their, their peace and their time to bring the decisions and greatness of this nation to the very front doors of their fellow American citizens and who invite those citizens to come to their front doors as well. I thank you, my friends. It was a pleasure speaking to you.